everybody. It's certainly good to be here for our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, I guess it's about time for us to get started. Uh, if you would, uh, bow with me as you go to God in prayer before we start. Our holy and righteous Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we fall before thee, confessing our sins. Father, please forgive us through the blood of thy son Jesus, that we may be forgiven and come into thy presence pure and holy. We're so thankful for the Christ, the life that he lived, our perfect example his teachings, Father, the church that he purchased with his blood, all the so many blessings we enjoy in Christ, one of which being able to assemble, to worship thee, to sing songs of praise unto thee, to study thy word. For such we are so grateful. Father, please be with us as we go through this study tonight. Help us to have minds that are ready and willing to study and to have wisdom and understanding as we approach thy word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, we on our Wednesday night classes, we've been going through uh, a book by Roy Deaver called How to Study the Bible. And what we're trying to do in this class, of which we're in the ninth week now, is we've been trying to learn how to be better Bible students. And we're learning how to be better Bible students because that's very important. The Bible charges those that would want to be acceptable to God that we need to study to show ourselves approved. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, which is sort of the uh, I guess, been the, the, the motivating verse of this class. And so everything's kind of revolving around that. And so when we become better Bible students, what we're doing is we're making better use of our time in our personal studies. Because we know how frustrating it can be to do anything if you don't have the technical knowledge to be able to know how to do it. It can be a very frustrating endeavor. Uh, for instance, the game of golf. I never really wanted to play golf. And when I go out and try to play golf, it's about the most frustrating thing in the world. And it's probably not good for my, for my well-being or my, my soul, really, to be out on the golf course. Because I don't know how to play golf. I never learned how. And so for me to attempt to play golf is a very frustrating thing. And so whenever we approach something, no matter what it may be, sometimes there's a, there's a level of technical knowledge to, to be able to have the know-how. So that when we approach and do that thing, we don't get frustrated and we don't get discouraged, and we certainly don't want that to be the case in our Bible study. We want to be good Bible students, and what we're doing in this class, we're trying to equip everybody, those young and old, those who are new Christians, been Christians for years, equip you with tools that you may have known about, maybe you haven't, to be able to make better use of your Bible study time, to be a better, uh, more efficient in your Bible study, to be a better Bible student. So that's kind of the goal of this class, and so we've been going through various topics uh, based upon the chapters in our book. Uh, last week we talked about character studies, and I thought we had a really, really good Bible study last week when we dealt with Aquila and Priscilla, and we talked about the value of character study and how to go about doing that. Who remembers the three main points uh, in our approach or method for doing a character Bible study that I wrote here on the board? What, what are the three main steps that, that I came up with? Again, it's not a hard and fast rule. You can come up with your own system. But what, do you remember what that was? What those words were? It was identify and investigate, calculate, evaluate. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you said that you remember. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I calculate that that sounds pretty good. All right. Okay, so identify. And so what did that have to do with this, Mr. Bell? What, what was the identify step? Anybody remember? Help them out. This is kind of making sure we know which Bible character we're talking about. For instance, if we picked out uh, somebody like, I don't know, uh, Saul. Is there more than one Saul in the Bible? Yes. yes. Do the Bible right person. Exactly. So find the right person. Make sure that, uh, that you're dealing with the right individual because sometimes more than one person in the Bible has the same name. Sometimes one person in the Bible is called by multiple different names. And so identify who we're talking about, then isolate those verses, and that's when we get into our investigate step, which is probably the most work involved in the investigate. That's when we're doing our detective work, right? When we're going, we're investigating, we're looking up the passages, we're learning all we can from them, like a detective would, gathering evidence. And then once we gather that evidence, what do we do? Evaluate, evaluate it, right? And what are some of the things we do in the evaluation step? Summarizing some verses. What's that? Yeah, exactly. So you find maybe one or two passages about that person that kind of encapsulate what they're all about. And 
for Aquila and Priscilla, we came up with the verse that talked about that they taught Apollos and the way of God more perfectly. Uh, and we talked about the verse in Romans 16.3 that had to do with them putting their necks on the line for Paul. And so those are kind of two verses that encapsulate what those characters are all about. So we find defining verses. Very good. What else? Yeah, exactly. What would, there, what would that mean? What's the historical contribution of something? Yeah, for that period of time, right? Yeah, what, what was their, what mark did they leave on that period of history? What impact did they make? How did they influence the people around them? And then what was the last step? Modern contribution is how we don't Exactly. So now you're moving from, from that into a modern application. What, what positive examples has a character set forth for me to emulate? And what negative examples does he set forth or she set forth to reject and not go in that direction? And so we always want to make modern application on our character studies. And so a very profitable ma manner of studying the Bible. I hope that's encouraged you to do character studies. And so uh, very good. Appreciate uh, your guys' recollection of that. So this week, uh, we're dealing with chapter 9, and we're studying the Bible by passage. And really, I think by passage, what is meant here is by, is by verse. I think that's kind of uses that term interchangeable. So we're studying the, the Bible by verse. Alright? So we're studying the Bible by passage or verse. And so we're now kind of shifting. Uh, thus far, we've done kind of broad strokes. We talked about how to study the Bible by topic. And so that's a broad way of studying the Bible. We talked about studying the Bible by character. Again, broad way of studying the Bible, looking at many different passages from many different books. But now we're shifting from that broader method of study to a more detailed method of study, where we're actually going to be getting into the nitty-gritty of the verses and seeing how, seeing what's being said by the authors. And so really, we kind of do this type of analysis in all the ones we've done before. When we look at topical, we go to all the verses, the individual passages that talk about a certain topic, and we have to analyze those. And so this is kind of a zoomed-in uh, study of how to analyze the verses themselves. And so that's kind of what we're dealing with today. Uh, studying the Bible by passage is attainable. If something is well within reach of everybody with a basic understanding of, uh, of English, a uh, basic ability to reason, it's something that we all can do. We can understand the Bible. We can understand the individual passages, even the ones that seem a little difficult at times. And so it's attainable, and it employs basic reasoning processes that some of us do. You know, we do a lot of this basic reasoning subconsciously, but we're going to kind of break that down on a conscious level uh, tonight. Let's just think about... Uh, communication for a minute. When we study by passage, we're dissecting a sentence and analyzing the individual components and seeing how they relate to the sentence or clause as a whole. Let me say that one more time. We're basically looking, when we're looking at a verse, we're looking at a passage, we're dissecting it. We're seeing how each word functions in that sentence. What part of speech is it? Is it the subject? Is it the direct object? Is it the verb? Uh, what's the tense? Does this occur in the future? Is this uh, talking about the past? Who's the subject? And so forth. We ask those types of questions. So we're dissecting the sentences themselves. And before we dive into that analysis, let's just kind of make this simple. When you think about communication, verbal communication or written communication, the basic building block of communication, once we have what we want to say in our mind, is we need to have a vehicle to communicate to somebody else. Either I'm going to write something down, or I'm going to say it verbally. And the basic building block would be, I guess you could say, letters in the alphabet. You have, uh, you know, A, B, C, D, and so on, all the way down to Z in, in our, so you have the, the alphabet. A, B, C, D. Now, and, and so forth, all the way down the alphabet. So in our, the English language, that, that's our alphabet. All words are based upon uh, some combination of letters that mean something to us. But if I were to say the letter B to you, or that's a bad example because that sounds like something else, or, or uh, A. If I say the letter A, I just say A, you're going to look at me like, well, what are you talking about? That, but that doesn't have any meaning attached to it. The only time that communicate, uh, these have meaning attached to them is when we combine them into words, which then have meaning to us. For instance, I now I'm going to make a word out of uh, the letter A. I'm going to say apple. Okay? Something a little more concrete now. When I say apple, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a fruit uh, that grows on a tree. It's very delicious, but still not very specific, right? 
Walter might be thinking about a nice Granny Smith apple. Or Laura might be thinking about a, a nice Fuji apple. Miss Betty might be thinking about an apple tree that uh, she remembers that was in her grandmother's yard growing up. You might be thinking about applesauce, Mr. Frank. I don't know. We have different kind of imprints on our mind about what an apple means to us. So I need to make this even more specific. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from what I, I form these letters into a, a word that we're familiar with, and now I'm going to make a sentence. All right? Getting me more details into what I'm trying to communicate. All right? So um, I like the taste of apples. Bible works just like this. 
Okay? You have the whole story of the Bible, and we talked about that. We started there. We started with the whole picture that the Bible is about redemption of mankind from their sins through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. That's what the whole thing's about. And then each book that's, in, that's included in that collection of books contributes to that thought somehow. All these books come together to, to add to this collection, the whole story. And so the book of Genesis tells us the beginning of this, tells us about the fall of man, tells us about the seeds of the plan of redemption being planted, the selection of Abraham and his family. And so that's what the book of Genesis is about. But Genesis is made up of chapters, and each chapter has its individual thrust. And each of those chapters is made up of multiple paragraphs that contain sentences that are made up of words. What we're talking about today, when we're studying by passage, we're talking about the sentences. We're starting here at this level. And to be honest, if I would have written this book, uh, at least in the ordering of the materials, I probably would not start here. Because he's going to go on the next, in the next chapter, he's going to talk about words. And then I think he's going to talk about by book, and then by chapter and by paragraph. It just I would progress. I might start with a word, sentence, paragraph, chapter, and, and go that way. But that's just not the way the material is arranged, and that's okay. But I just wanted to make it clear what exactly we're talking about when we say we study by passage. All right? Any questions so far? All right. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, look at the questions. Uh, let's look at uh, number 43, which is the first question of uh, chapter 9 here, studying by passage. What, what does this uh, question say? All right. Very good. We should study the Bible by passage. Very good. All right. Let's do number 44.
ran quickly to the store. Quickly would tell you how I ran. So that's an adverb. It modifies the verb. Furthermore, you have what's called adjectives, which modify what? Now, right? And so when if I say I have a shirt on, that doesn't matter. Yeah, I have a shirt on. But if I say I have a yellow shirt on, the yellow is what modifies the noun. And so that's, that's something that tells you maybe what kind, how many, and so forth. And so that's just kind of a, those are things we're aware of. But um, it, it kind of gets down to grammar as to what kind of questions that we ask. So what is to be done with the verb? Uh, who or what is being talked about is the subject and adjectives. How is it being done is an adverb question. Where will it be done is an adverb question. When will it be done is a verb question or the tense of the verb. And why is it being done is kind of where our analyst hats come on. Because we, we take into account everything that's happening, but then we ask why. And so we're asking these basic questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And different parts of the sentence answer those questions for us. And so we're analyzing what's going on in a particular verse. Now, analyzing, it takes work. Okay, we, we, we don't just go through this process just by glazing over something in our reading. We have to consciously think about these things. And so this is what's called active reading. Uh, in Mortimer Adler's book, How to Read a Book, uh, he, he said this in, in, in kind of a paraphrase. He said, reading is an activity, and therefore all reading must to some degree be active. There's no such thing as completely passive reading. It may feel like that sometimes when we're tired and our eyes are just kind of blazing across the page. But even though we might not be as coherent as we are when we read late at night versus maybe when we're fresh in the morning, there's still an active process going on. My eyes are moving across the page. I'm holding the book. I'm engaging somehow with the text. All reading is active. So it's not a question whether or not reading is active. The question is how active are we in our reading? That's the difference. The more active we are in reading, the better we're going to be at analyzing and understanding what's going on. All right? So some think that reading and listening is a passive activity, just like you're listening to me right now. It, uh, some people think this is passive. Well, no. There's, there's a hearing involved. There's some sort of process that's going on in your mind for you receiving this message. And so all listening, all reading is active to some degree. Now, a good illustration of this that he uses in his book is kind of like baseball. Well, you have the pitcher who throws the ball. He's sending the message, if you will. And then you have a catcher who has to catch the ball. Now, one person kind of initiates the process, and one terminates it, both by their conscious effort. And so the sender has effort in his sending the message, but the receiver, even though he's catching the ball, it's not just passive. He has to catch it. He has to catch the curveball sometimes. He has to catch a changeup, fastball. He still has to catch the ball. If anything's passive, it's the ball itself, the actual communication, the words on the page. But as readers, as students, as listeners, we are never active, uh, inactive rather. But it's just a matter of how active we're going to be. And so we need to be good biblical analysts. And that takes work. It takes active reading sometimes, okay? Now, any thoughts on that? Okay. He used a few examples uh, in this chapter. He, he pointed out some verses, uh, the first of which was Matthew 6, 33. And then he goes on in Matthew 16, uh, in the latter part of verse 18. And he takes individual components of those sentences. And then he, what he does, what he does is he, he asks certain questions and determines facts about the verse based on those components. And so what I'd like to do is just uh, go through those together and uh, see see if everybody agrees with uh, his analysis and maybe if you came up with some different ideas we can uh, talk about those but let's just uh, go through the same examples that he uses uh, in this chapter. Alright, so the first one is Matthew 6.33, alright? So I'm just going to write uh, the verse on top, so this is Matthew 6.33 but and let me know if I miss a word or something, but seek ye first the kingdom of God.
but, right? And so he, he singles out this word. It's a, it's a coordinating conjunction. All right? So what's he say about that? It denotes a contrast, right? Okay? So contrast is the idea here. So we know that whatever was said before this, Jesus is drawing a contrast between that thought and the one he's about to set forth. And so that tells us a lot automatically. Conjunctions tell us a lot in the Bible. Look out for them. Look out for words like but, uh, therefore, or wherefore. Those are very telling. Because what they, when you see the word therefore, what are you supposed to ask? What's it there for? Right? He usually connects what was said just before that. It's like, okay, well, this is true. Therefore, here's the conclusion. And so anytime you see therefore, that's a very telling uh, conjunction. And so look out for words like therefore, wherefore, but is a, is a way to show a contrast. All right, so very good. So we've already learned that this is a contrast, what was just said. Now what's next? Seek. Seek, okay. So this is our verb, right? All right, so uh, in the King James English, uh, sometimes it's a little different. Uh, we would probably say this, you seek first. But sometimes they put the verb and then the uh, subject of the verb right after it. And so you just have to keep that in mind that the word order is not always the same as the King James. So seek. All right. So what do you say about that? The obligation. I'm sorry? Obligation. Obligation. Okay. So Jesus is giving an imperative command and therefore an obligation. And so here you have an obligation set before the reader. All right. What's next? that indicate? Order. So whatever it is that we're to seek, that we have an obligation to seek, it's to be first place. Okay? Not second, not last. This is first. So it denotes the order in which it's to be sought. Okay? Moving along, what's next? Kingdom of God. Kingdom, I'm going to Kingdom. Kingdom and righteousness. And righteousness. Alright, so that's this conjunction joins these two. What do you say about that? It's the object. It's the object, right? Object of the seeking. So what is to be sought? What do, what do we have an obligation to seek? His righteousness. Right, right. Kingdom and his righteousness. And what and what's the priority of the kingdom and his righteousness? First. First. That's the order. All right, so already we're learning a lot about this verse. Now, what's next? And all these things shall be added unto you. The, the, the conditional promise, though, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you seek the kingdom first and his righteousness, will everybody do that first? But to those that do seek it first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. And so that's the conditional Promise, right? All right, so let's put this together. We know what the verse says, and we probably could have drawn a lot of these conclusions just by reading. But let's just maybe try to paraphrase this in a different way. Who wants to try to give us that based on some of these things we pointed out? So in contrast to what I just said, but... You need to seek. And when I say seek, that, that's an imperative command. You have an obligation to do this. And not just an obligation, but an obligation to do it first. You, all of you. Second person plural. Here. What do you to seek? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the thing that you're to be seeking first, always. And if you do that, what's going to happen to you? And all these things shall be added unto you. Now the, the important thing is these things. In this context, it's the uh, kind of the physical provisions of life is what's under consideration when you study the passage before this. And so you see the value in doing this type of type of analysis on individual passages, so we can come clearly to the meaning. And guess what? We didn't have to go to the Greek to understand this. We didn't have to do that. We took it into English. We have great translations from the Greek, and then we've come to know what what God wants us to know from this passage. And so this is within uh, the capability of everybody who can understand the language and the grammar of sentences and so forth, all right? So very good. 
All right, now let's do the next example. Any, any questions on this one before we uh, move on? Does that make sense? Is that pretty clear? All right, very good. All right, so now let's do uh, Matthew 16, uh, the second part of verse 18. And so uh, who wants to kind of, who, who knows what's going on in Matthew chapter 16, just for, just for fun? What's that? All right. Very important statement by the Lord. Who knows where it was made? I think verse 13 tells you. Yeah, that's where he Philippi. He comes with his disciples, and uh, Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am, and how did, how did they respond? So the church tells us what? The nature of, of the, the institution, right? You know, if uh, you were to say, I'm going to build my uh, cathedral, or I'm going to build my temple, then we might be thinking of maybe something like a physical building. But he said church. And so this tells us the nature of the thing he's going to build. What's that indicator? 
What's that? Certainty of it. Certainty, right? Certainty and security. Certainty, security, the uh, stability of it, indestructible nature of it. Good. Promise. What's that? The promise. Mm -hmm. The promise. Great. And so what do we have here? Upon this rock, the foundation that Peter just declared that Christ is the Son of God, I, Christ, will build. So Christ is the builder of what? Of the church that he owns. He's the possessor of it. Acts 20, 28 says he purchased it with his own blood. And the church is telling us the nature of the institution, the spiritual body, not a physical building, a spiritual body. Ephesians 5 talks about the church being a body. And so the nature of the institution is given. And the surety, the certainty and security, the indestructible nature is given in this last statement. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And so you see, you know, how we can really amplify our study versus, you know, when we just kind of read over the text, you may miss a lot of that and not really digest what's being said. And so when we stop and slow down and ask these types of questions, looking at the different elements and asking questions of them, well, what's this rock talking about? Well, it's talking about the foundation, and the foundation was what Peter just said. And you look at the personal pronouns, they tell us a lot. And sometimes these little details that, you know, sometimes we just, you know, we don't think about tell us a lot about the verse and eliminate a lot of confusion that exists about certain passages, all right? What's that? No, I don't think so. No. All right. So, any other any thoughts on on those two? All right. Let's look at uh, number uh, forty-seven. What are the two basic points to keep in mind in passage study?
different applications. If we're Christians and we believe we belong to the church, do we have any fear of something threatening upon the power of the church, the certainty and strength of it? I don't. Jesus said the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It's indestructible. We belong to an indestructible institution. It brings us comfort. It brings us hope. You know, Christ is the one that paid for the church. I know it's, it, this is a legitimate institution. I don't have to worry about it. I trust it. What else? All right. Well, those are just some ways that we, we try to apply what's going, uh, what's going on here. Uh, I do have one handout, and I won't take long to go over it, but I just wanna, I want you to have this, because these are just some practical guidelines uh, for trying to study by passage. So check these out. Uh, use them if you can. I hope they're helpful to you. You may have some other methods you'd like to use to study individual passages. I think we got enough. I'll just I'll just read these very quickly and then uh, we'll, we'll ask for questions and then wrap up. All right. Guidelines. Number one: realize that every passage has but one meaning. And I have a little bit of an elaboration under that. And what I'm what I say under that is that does not mean that a passage may not have an immediate context or fulfillment or meaning and then still have a remote meaning because an example of this would be Genesis 12, 1-3 when it talks about the Abrahamic promise. Now, the promise of the land that was made to Abraham was something that was going to come relatively soon. But the seed promise that all nations of the earth would be blessed through his seed wouldn't be something that would be fulfilled until the time of Christ. And so while it's the same verse, same passage, you have kind of a dual fulfillment. So I'm not talking about prophecies like that, but generally, a passage has a singular definite meaning. Number two, the simplest, most obvious meaning of any passage is usually the correct one. You ever have you know, a gut feeling about something? How people say you need to trust your gut? You know, sometimes just the most simple, clear gut reaction to a passage usually is what it means. The Bible isn't too complicated to understand. There's difficult passages, of course. But usually the most simple explanation is the one to be preferred. Always allow an author's own explanation of a passage to stand. And so if somebody in the same book you're studying defines what's being taught in a certain verse, use his explanation in that passage. And let the author define what's going on. Always interpret a passage in harmony with the context. You can't interpret something out of context. Always got to study it in its context, literary, uh, cultural, historical. Uh, number five. An interpretation of a passage should always conform to the environment of the author. Uh, a good example of this would be the parables. You know, Jesus would take things that were part of every, people's everyday environment and taught them practical lessons from that. Now, their everyday environment isn't necessarily our everyday environment. And so I can't take something that Jesus says in a parable and automatically uh, say that that applies to something that's in my everyday environment without doing a little homework to study on that culture. Uh, number six. Uh, each passage must be interpreted in harmony with all other passages. And number seven, all passages on any given subject must be studied to arrive at uh, the total biblical conclusion of the matter. So that's kind of the topical study method. When you're studying on one particular doctrine or one particular subject, you've got to study it all. So you do this type of analysis on all of those verses to arrive at the conclusion on what the Bible says about the matter. Uh, and number eight, uh, let plain passages determine more difficult passages. And so where you have... In scripture, a passage is very plain. You can, you can rest on that. And then you get to a passage that talks about the same topic, but it's a little more vague, maybe a little, uh, a little more difficult. You have to interpret the more difficult one in light of the easier one to understand. All right? Because the Bible is in harmony and it cannot disagree. All right, so there's great value in studying the Bible by passage in that we can understand what is meant by a single sentence. The value is only realized when we follow some guidelines, and the value is only realized when that sentence is fit into the larger paragraph, the paragraph into the chapter, the chapter into the book, etc. You see, there's this order that is in language, starting with the basic blocks, the letter, forming words, forming sentences, forming paragraphs, and so forth. There's an order to it. And so we're going to understand the Bible a lot better when we understand what the words mean, which we'll talk about next time, how those words operate in sentence, which is what we talked about today. How a sentence fits into the paragraph it's talking about, and how that paragraph fits into the chapter in the book, and so forth. And we come to understand the Bible.
Bible a lot better. Uh, for next time, we're going to study uh, chapter 10, uh, Studying by Word. And if you don't have a word study book, that's okay. There's so many online resources if you use the internet that are completely free to use. Uh, I'm just going to write a couple of them on the board just for your uh, own reference if you want to check these out. So maybe when you're going through this study of uh, these word studies, you can check out these sites. And I'm not saying I agree with everything that's found on these sites. They're just good resources with free uh, word study uh, type tools. And so uh, biblos.com, that's B-I-D-L-O-S.com, and also uh, BibleStudyTools.com is another one. BibleStudyTools.com. Anybody else have some other ones that you use that have worked for you? Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway? Yeah. Is that just BibleGateway.com? Right. Bible Gateway? Okay. Anybody else? There's a StudyLife.com. StudyLife.com? Mm -hmm. Very good. There's just a lot of uh, great resources that have become uh, public domain and they're just they're available free, so you know, you're welcome to use these. You don't have to spend a lot of money to Biblos.com, BibleStudyTools.com, Bible Gateway, and Study Life. Any closing questions or comments before we get into our devotional period? Thank you for your attention. Take your song book, turn it to page 501. Thank you. 
pick back up where we left off uh, some weeks ago. On Wednesday nights, we've been just taking little portions of the book of James and going through in a somewhat detailed fashion as to what James is saying. And so we're going to pick up in James chapter 4 and beginning at verse 1. And we're going to see here that James is writing in response to some problems that he was aware of in the church, or the churches to which he was writing. And so one of those problems is going to become very apparent, very evident in these passages. And so in James 4.1, we're going to learn about a worldly attitude, worldly actions, and their consequences. And at the heart of worldliness is selfishness, because in the world, people just want to do what they want to do. And so out in the world, you have a lot of people vying for self-interest. And so when that is what pervades a Christian's thinking, there's inevitable problems. And we're going to see three main points in this short amount of text in verses 1 through 6. We're going to see that worldliness destroys relationships with brethren. Worldliness then destroys our relationship with God, and it last of all destroys our hope of heaven. Notice the question James sets forth in James chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? He's asking what the source of the fighting that exists is. And so he's acknowledging that there is some fighting, some infighting within the church to which he was writing. And that term war is a little misleading. It's not talking about a war, a bloody war like uh, we're familiar with, with maybe the war that's going on in Afghanistan, the Middle East. But this is more of a quarrel between people, interpersonal conflict, strife, conflicts. And so he says, what is the source of these things? He says, come they not hence? even of your lust, that war in your members? And so James, by inspiration, identifies the source of these fightings, these strikes. He says, it's from the lust. That term in the Greek literally means pleasures. It's from the Greek term hedonon, which translated or evolved into the word hedonist. And so we're familiar with hedonism, which is basically just seeking self-pleasure. That's the philosophy of the Epicureans, seeking self-pleasure. That's the ultimate goal of life. And so those of you who are seeking your own pleasures, there are hedonists, those things are warring within you, that's the cause of your fightings and your strife. He says, you lust and you have not. Ye kill, not literally, but figuratively, and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. James, in principle here, is teaching that the right kind of person praying with the right kind of purpose is going to get the things, is going to get an answer from God in his prayers. But these people, who were just praying for things that were serving their self-interest, were not going to get answered by God. And we know that from the next portion of this verse. He says, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. When he says, because you ask amiss, he's indicating that they're asking God for things from the wrong motives. They're asking things of God from selfish ambitions. So that these are wrong motives, selfish considerations, not within the will of God. What they were trying to do is ask for things that they were just going to consume with their own lust anyway. This is the type of person who is praying for more money so they can buy a nicer car to keep up with their neighbor. That's hedonism. That's asking amiss. This is somebody who's asking for good health so they can live longer in a life of sin. Now, the person who asks for money from the right motives may get it. Somebody who's actually in need, who's struggling to provide for his or her family, that person praying from the right motives to provide for righteous things, they might get answered by God. They're going to get answered by God. The person who asks for a long life so they can serve in the kingdom longer might be blessed by God in that way if it's within his will. But the person who asks from the wrong motives is not going to get a positive answer from God. He calls them adulterers and adulteresses. This is probably figurative. Uh, the ASV kind of uh, implies that somewhat. If you compare this with the spiritual adultery of the ch children of Israel, you see that the Bible uses adultery as a, as a spiritual or a figurative depiction of people who have been in covenant with God, have been married to him, but have walked away from him and turned to idols, to selfishness. He says, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, is the enemy of God, is hostility with God. And so here's the heart of this entire passage. Friendship
friendship with the world is enemy, is enmity, and is hostility towards God. The person who shares the world views and values of the world is somebody who's sharing the world views and values of Satan himself, because Satan is the ruler of this present world. He says, whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. One thing we can know for sure is that somebody who is considered a friend of the world, the world, not, not just you know being able to go out and have friends that are not Christians or go out in the workplace that isn't a Christian environment, that's not what it's talking about. But people who, sh- who are worldly, if you're a friend of the world, you are automatically an enemy of God. It's not something that you can be a friend of the world and kind of have one foot in, one foot out. If you're a friend of the world, you are automatically in the category of an enemy of God. And notice it says, whosoever. This could be somebody who sits on the pew every Sunday, every Wednesday. This could be somebody who might be a preacher. This might be somebody who would appear to be faithful. So it says, whosoever. It's not limited. This is anyone, so we all need to be on guard against this. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resisteth the proud. That term resisteth is a military term, to set an array against. It's as if God is setting himself in array against you if you're proud. This idea, again, of self. Self-interest, worldliness, that's pride. Thinking more highly of oneself than someone ought to. But notice who he gives grace to, but giveth grace unto the humble. The humble, somebody who recognizes their own littleness in the presence of God, who humbly serves him, they're going to receive grace. The proud, those who are self-sufficient, they will receive wrath. Titus 2 and verse 12. And so worldliness, self-interest, hedonism, Seeking our own personal pleasures to the expense of doing the will of God and seeking the interests of our brethren destroys our relationships with brethren. It creates strife between each other when we're only caring about our own interests. It destroys our relationship with God. If we're worldly, that makes us an enemy of Almighty God who wants to be our best friend, who sent us his son to die for us. But worldliness does that. And it also destroys our hope because this passage plainly tells us that the person who's proud, God's against him. The hope we have is of heaven. And if we want that hope of heaven, we need to be in the humble category, humble servants of his, that we might receive grace, as James indicates in this passage. And so worldliness is certainly in opposition to godliness and Christian living and so forth. And so we don't want to be a friend of the world. We want to be friends of God. The way we can be a friend of God is like Abraham was a friend of God. He believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And when we approach the scripture today, we look at what the New Testament says about how we can approach God and obey him, that we might be counted righteous. The Bible lays out plainly his plan of redemption that he set in motion from the beginning of the world. He sent his son to die for us, and based on what Christ did for us, we can have access to justification, to salvation. And so, The Lord's invitation is extended at this time. It's as if Jesus is holding his arms wide open. We're extending the Lord's invitation, not just the invitation here at Northside, not just because we're offering it, but the Lord is extending it. He's told us what we have to do to come to him acceptably. He teaches us we have to hear his word. And that produces faith in us and belief. Romans 10, 17 tells us that plainly. And so we have to believe in this gospel. Jesus himself said, he that believeth, and is baptized shall be saved. And so belief and faith is part of our salvation process. But once we believe, we don't just stop there. We have to keep on going. We have to realize that we've been living a life of sin in opposition to God, and that hurts God. And we have to repent of that. That means we change our mind based upon that horrible feeling we feel, and it results in a change of our lifestyle. Acts 17.30 teaches that's required of all men. We confess with gladness that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, as we studied about Peter in Matthew 16. And that's a condition of salvation, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then we're baptized for the remission of sins. We can be forgiven of all those past iniquities. To walk in the newness of life, Romans 6. Everybody has access to that. All people who are accountable can be washed of their sins. And if you've done that, if you've entered into that grace, if you've become a Christian and you've walked away from God, perhaps the world has got a hold of you again so to speak. 
And you need to come back into his fold, to come back into friendship with God. You can do that tonight. You can do it privately if it's a private matter, or if it's a public matter, you can make it known before the congregation. And you can leave here tonight right in the sight of God. Please, if you're not in that condition, please make the decision to do so while together we stand and sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of
Ulcerative. Ulcerative, yes, colitis. So you see, uh, I've known somebody who's had this, maybe some of you are familiar with that condition. Um, it's, that's, not a, that's not a good thing. It's, it, I guess it's a pretty uh, that bad situation. He's up in a, ch a children's hospital uh, in uh, around the Atlanta area, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Atlanta Pediatric Hospital. And so we need to remember Elijah Ellis uh, in our prayers. This is a chronic disease, probably will never just rid himself completely of it. So something will have to deal with his whole life, as far as I understand. So we need to remember uh, Elijah in our prayers. Uh, is there anybody else that we need to remember in prayer? Thank you. 